So in 2011 and 2012, uh, you may recall they were dry years. This is a picture taken from one of those years. I can't remember which one, but these are, this is a silphium uh, experiment, and this is a Maximilian sunflower experiment. Both of them are perennials. They're both closely related. They were planted the same year. They've been watered the same amount, which is basically none. Um, so everything about these is pretty much the same, except this species during this drought is very wilted. The plants are very stunted. The leaves are curled and, and kind of gray looking. And the silphium looks bright green. They're flowering normally. Uh, they got much larger. And uh, so we, we had always known that the, the writers, uh, there's a guy named John Weaver from University of Nebraska who wrote a, a lot of papers that had to do with the Dust Bowl. And he mentioned that some of the species like Silphium, he included, he specifically named this one, and there, there are a few others, seem to get through those, those super dry years in the 30s. They looked more or less normal. They might have flowered a little earlier or something, but they completed their life cycle. They flowered, they set seeds, whereas, whereas most of the other plants, including the grasses, just turned brown and died. Flowers. I don't know if most people don't know that. I grow sunflowers and I look at them real close. Okay, so yeah. yeah, so you know that there's lots of little flowers and each one has petals and each one has pollen. If you at least it looks that way, right? So the ones on the very outside are the have, they all have, if you looked really carefully, you'd see that they all have um, little petals, right? And, and anthers and things mm -hmm. in each one of these. But the ones on the outside have one really big one and four <laughs> normal okay. size ones. I'd never looked at that, okay, realized so, that, okay. So that's why the, around the outside you get this, what we call the petals. I mean, they're actually a specialized kind of petal. And in, in the annual sunflower, so silphium looks a lot like this. You know, you, a lot of people would think it's a sunflower. In the, in the regular sunflowers that we're used to, the wild ones and the tame ones, the botanists call these, these florets around the edge uh, disc, uh, sorry, ray florets, because these are, they call these the rays. So all the ones right around the edge, the outer, outer ring of those are called the ray florets. And the inner ones are called the disc florets, because that is just like a, kind of like a disc. In the normal sunflowers, the, the seeds are all on these disc florets. So the, the little florets around the very edge um, don't set seed. They're just kind okay. of little tiny things. You hardly even notice them. It's exactly the opposite with silphium. So in silphium, only the ones around the edge produce seeds. Okay. And all the ones in the middle uh, pr only produce pollen. Which is kind of unusual. Uh, this gene is a little unusual for that. Um, you know, most in most plant flowers, they have both. Okay, because as I was bisexual. reading, you, you kept talking about the number of petals on the flower. That explains yeah. why that's important. Yeah, exactly. So that's that made it very easy when I was doing this. I would just count how many petals there were because I know, knew that that at least gives you the potential. Now, not everyone might get poll pollinated, but um, if they did all get pollinated, that that gives you the upper limit. If you had sixty petals. You're never going to get more than 60 seeds. Okay. You might get less, but you'd probably get around 60. Um, so it's a very simple way. Instead of having to destructively open them up and count them all or, or wait for them to set seeds and then harvest them and thresh them and record them and then try and go back to that plant. Since every plant produces multiple heads, we can just go through and... And unfortunately, by the time you can see these, it, probably those, those have already been pollinated. So we would mark that plant and then wait for another head to open up on that. Um, oh, because that one would have that been would already been haunted by random stuff. Right, right. So, look, thinking about those number of seeds per head, um, you know, maybe the average was around fifteen or something when we started, and the upper upper range was, you know, twenty five or so. And so we took these very few ones plants that had about twenty five plant them out again. Well, what happens is it's not that you start from here, it's that you start something like, like from here the next time. So the average may have shifted somewhat, but the average isn't even up to here where you started. Okay. Uh, but now we've got some out in this tail here that are 
you know, maybe more like 35 or 40. And so we choose those ones and intermediate those ones. And, you know, and, and then the, the bell curve moves um, again. And we, we do this several times. And so now, the last time I did this um, and looked at this population, I had some, well, this, this is, the scale isn't very good here, but I had some that were over like 160. So I guess the scale isn't, isn't a scale. And the average, um, well, I guess I should draw another one on here. The average of now is about 50. Um, you know, with the upper range being here. So at this point, I decided to stop because um, my goal was about 100. Okay. And now I want to get the average up to 100 probably. But uh, I figured what I really also need to do is start breeding for yield uh, and seed size and things like that, not just the number of seeds. Because we could end up with, you know, 200 tiny little seeds, and that's not what we want either. So in the end, we need to... Um, to get a lot of other traits. And so now I've kind of branched out and I'm continuing to, you know, I couldn't help but take some of these really high ones that were over a hundred mm -hmm. and cross them with each other. Uh, but I also crossed them with some of the ones that were better for other things and, you know, pretty good, you know, 50, 60, 70, um, for seed size, uh, shattering, uh, resistance, mm -hmm. which means they tend to stay on the plant and not just blow off. So then we would bet we'd cross those ones all the ones that had lots of these petals, the ligules, and um, and then go collect pollen from those ones that we had bagged and cross them with each other. So that made it very easy. So anyway, get to back back to your question. The big trade-off is going to be as we increase the number of sort of rings, because now we've got not just the outer ring, but we've got some of the other rings are also producing. We've sort of converted them into these. You know, and sometimes it's multiple. It's getting to look more and more like a chrysanthemum or something. Um, and now, only, only the, the very middle flowers are actually producing any pollen. So, so that's sort of the cost, is that at some point you might end up with a plant that really almost produces no pollen. Now, that's okay as long as it's surrounded by normal plants, but if you had the whole field like that, um, for this species, that could be a problem. Because silphium is not self-pollinated. It's right? not self-pollinated, right. Not yet, at least. That may be something we could work on. And, well, and then, in fact, the problem is, even if it was, if it doesn't have any of the flowers with anthers, it's still not, it just simply won't produce enough pollen. Um, now, we're, we're nowhere near that yet, although I will say some of the very extreme ones, they really don't have that many. Now, it doesn't take too many to, to produce gobs of pollen. Yeah, you know, plants in general way overproduce pollen because it's there's sort of an evolutionary arms race. Anyway, so that that is the most obvious trade-off is that we're we're kind of increasing the number of florets that can produce seeds, but decreasing the number that can produce pollen, and that's an acceptable trade-off for from our perspective for the moment. Okay, um, okay the trade-offs I was thinking more in terms of would be having how, all if that it, weight if it or, can fill all those seeds. Yeah. So that's yeah. So that's that's the biggie, and that's going to apply no matter how we increase yield. Um, the question of whether we can uh, actually find enough energy somewhere in the plant to, to store up all that oil yeah. that we want to get out of those seeds. So that's that's a question that that we have tried to address for all of our crops. Because right. so my one answer is. Um, that we've written lengthy articles trying to explain why we think we can um, without sacrificing their ability to survive the winter. Mm -hmm. Now, there, there will be some sort of limit, you know, but we just don't think we're anywhere near that. We think that okay. at some point, yes, there's, there's, there's only so much mattered energy to go around. Right. Um, I mean, you can, you can, and I'm familiar with the kind of calculations, how much energy is there in a gallon of gas? Right, right. It, is, Something similar right. to that with plants, or is yeah. it a lot more complicated? Well, I'm sure it's more complicated. Um, so maybe I was just reading about these electric vehicles and electric cars, and they were saying, unlike a gas car where you you know you turn the heater on when it's cold and it's just waste heat from the engine, with a, oh, yeah. with an electric car that's a that drains your battery. Right. So you you can either get miles out of that battery that you charge it up, 
Um, and if you start turning on the air conditioner or the heater or lights or the radio or anything else, I mean, now some of those are trivial, but yeah. it's going to reduce. So it's either or. You either get another 10 miles per charge or you can be warm. Yeah. So the, the leaves are out there. They're photosynthesizing. They're like solar collectors. Um, they're getting energy from the sun. And then they can decide what to do with that energy. They can store it away in the roots. They can put it into seeds. They can make wood out of it or whatever. Um, and so that we've struggled for a long time with both internally and, and with other people with this idea of okay, if we take a wild plant like silphium that, that allocates it in certain ways and we change that sort of investment portfolio quite radically and have it invest a lot more in seeds, is that going to take away a lot from other things? Yeah. A and yes, it will. It will. But we think that we, there's a lot of room to do that um, without actually hurting the plant very much because, because these are, have evolved under a very different environment that doesn't even exist today. So they, okay. they, they're adapted to the prairies of, because evolution is slow, mm -hmm. of you know, 10,000 years ago or something, okay. or, or the last 10,000 years, let's say. And so the big things they had to deal with were, you know, the, 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 for a long-lived plant, the drought that comes along every 50 years that kills most of the plants, or the herd of bison that comes along and just totally tramples the plant and, you know, almost kills it, or some plague of, of grasshoppers that, that descends and defoliates the whole plant, or wildfire in the middle of July just as they're about to flower and they put all their energy into seeds and things and suddenly a fire comes along and burns everything up. Most of those aren't going to happen anymore. So, and and if these are okay. crops, we don't really care. Let's say there is a drought that killed them all. Every couple times a century that happens. Well, we've got seed we can replant. We don't need them to each survive for thousands of years, which some of these plants probably could and, and may have wow. survived. Well, we know trees have for sure. We don't know so much about these because they kind of they kind of move around. They, they produce little runners and things and and so it's hard to say exactly how old they are but some of them may at least be hundreds if you know if not many hundreds of years old okay. range so there's there's a legitimate reason why the wild plant only made maybe 15 seeds a year because it was doing so many other things too that yeah once it's domesticated so it doesn't have to worry about there's two answers to that one okay. is that yes, it, there may have been other things it needed to do with that energy more than make seeds. You know, producing defensive chemicals or so, storing up enough food to get a, get through you know really bad decade or something, <laughs> whatever. Um, the other thing is actually evolution isn't super efficient, and part of it is just they didn't need any more seed really because they're so long lived that in the prairies. Once, once a piece of bare ground is, is occupied by whether it's forest or grassland, there isn't a lot of turnover. And so okay. almost every year a plant produces a few thousand seeds. Probably most years none of those ever become a new plant. They may sprout, but there's just nowhere to go. It's just kind of like the acorns in a forest. If the forest is full of oak trees, those acorns don't have a chance. There's no open spaces. And so evolution doesn't have much of a chance to operate on that. Um, it's just not a big driver of their fitness okay. in those environments. More of a driver is going to be their ability to, to just outlive their neighbors or their competitors, that kind of thing. So that's, that's a theory we have is that it doesn't, may not really uh, help them to produce this many seeds, this few seeds, mm -hmm. but it didn't really need to produce anymore. And so there was just kind of very little selection to do so and so um they just it just kind of may kind of decline almost um, that's 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 one answer to get back to the metaphor of the electric vehicle sometimes when you're uh talking about something like a like an electric powered thing um you when when you're designing that device or that vehicle you decide how big of a battery to put in there and if you don't need a bigger battery well you don't put in a bigger battery yeah um 
And so, in some senses, these plants we think are what we call sink limited. So, so plant biologists talk about sources mm -hmm. and sinks. It's just it's sort of like the uh, the faucet and the drain. <laughs> okay. Um, the, the sources, of course, are are the leaves in plants. And, you know, for for other animals, they're you know the the mouth or the stomach or whatever. The sink is what happens to that. So in a plant, the these sinks sort of compete with each other. Obviously, seeds are one that are demanding food. The roots, the stems, the storage organs, you know, the tubers or whatever, they're all sinks in, from our, the way we talk about that. Okay. But, but breeders have long debated whether most plants are source limited or sink limited. So it, when, we, when, we've, when we've seen that we've bred corn or wheat to be higher yielding, then we have to ask, well, why, why were the old ones lower yielding? Okay. Right? So that's, I was going to get to this, uh -huh. uh, but I've gotten there a little sooner. You know, this is a question that doesn't just apply to perennials or what we're doing. It applies to the question of why can we get 300 bushel per acre corn now when, you know, a century ago it was far lower. You know, mm -hmm. one, one theory is that that we've been able to, to provide the nutrients and breed them to have bigger leaves or leaves that are more efficient. Mm -hmm. So they're actually producing more energy. Uh, and that's the thing that's driven it. The other th theory is that, well, actually what we did is just, we just made them produce more seeds. Those seeds are sort of sending a signal to the leaves, hey, keep working, keep producing. You know, it, it's, it's almost like, um, it can get backed up in a sense that that if 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 the plant's producing sugar and no, nothing's using that sugar, then it just stops making more. Um, okay. I'm okay. trying to think of a good metaphor for that. <laughs> um, well, it's a little bit like charging up your battery. If if the battery's getting full, then it stops charging, right? It doesn't. Does it, it continue? To, yeah, yeah, right. It may turn itself off again. Um, and and plants are somewhat like that. If if the plant doesn't have anything that it really needs to do with that energy that it's getting from the sun, it may, and there's some evidence that it, it gets less efficient. It kind of, it kind of slows down. It, the leaves aren't working full bore. And you know, some of that may be because that, that conserves moisture. Um, uh, who knows? Evolution, again, isn't human and it doesn't care about maximizing everything. Okay. It's not trying to maximize photosynthesis or or biomass or seed production. The only thing that matters in evolution is just which things tend to outcompete each other. What survives. Yeah, what yeah. survives and not maximizing stuff. We we tend to be, you know, especially in our country, our traditions tend to think about optimizing things and maximizing and and we sort of expect that nature will be like this, that it'll, you know, that evolution has kind of made things, pushed them to the limit and, and made them as good as they can be. Um, and that's, they're just as good as, they, they just get to be slightly better than something else. Okay. <laughs> and that doesn't mean they've reached some sort of, some sort of pure uh, theoretical optimum. Okay. So uh, we do feel like it's important to point out to people that if you looked at the the ancestors of wild wheat and wild corn and wild sorghum, they all yield a lot less than our modern ones. Why is that? Where did that come from? Because people ask us, well, where do you think, just like you did, where yeah. where is this going to come from? You're going to you're putting on you're making this thing build all these new seeds. Where's the energy going to come from? And exactly the same thing happened with wheat and corn and, and milo and oats and everything else. That somehow those wild plants didn't need to produce a lot of more seeds. And so they just didn't. We came along and said, yeah, we want you to produce more seeds. And lo and behold, they, you know, after centuries of breeding, you know, they, they were able to. So mm -hmm. we kind of feel the same thing will happen. Um, and we have evidence that it, it is happening. The, the, the question that you hinted at is whether or not that's going to come at some cost that, that's going to kind of catch us unawares. Um, and, and so we're kind of prepared for that. Yes, we think it probably will shorten their lifespan somewhat. Just mm -hmm. Not that they, plants, unlike animals, don't really have a lifespan. 
They don't, um, most plants, their odds of dying in any given period of time don't increase. They don't get old. Um, but uh, anyway, so, so we may end up with plants that, that the odds get, are much higher, that they're, they're just not likely to survive for hundreds and hundreds of years, like maybe their ancestors okay. could have. That they will be 10. more vulnerable. Yeah, if we can get them to five or 10 years, okay. that will be a huge advantage to us. So I don't think we're at risk of turning them into annuals, but I think probably there will be some loss of, of super longevity.